This is Science Friday. I'm the guy that's been hired to make you think everything's going just fine. An algorithm is a series of steps a computer takes in arriving at a decision. Algorithms are used to figure out what posts pop up in your social media feed. They can suggest a song you might like or recommend a spot for dinner. That's something that gets your attention. But what about when algorithms are used in higher stakes decision making, like determining a jail sentence or where to send police on foot patrols? This is the stuff that might make you think a bit more deeply. And with that in mind, researchers wanted to understand how some of those algorithms work and compare them to how people actually think. They tested a tool that is used to predict if a defendant is a risk for committing another crime. And they found that a group of randomly sampled untrained people arrived at the same predictive rate as the algorithm. And they published their, their study in the journal Science Advances. Well, could these algorithms help in public policy decision making? How much do we know about their accuracy? And what does it mean to program fairness and justice into the algorithm? That's what we're going to be talking about. We have up there uh, on our website a question, would you trust an algorithm over what a person says? Maybe we'll get some results of that query by the end of the, of the program. Let me introduce uh, my first guest. Compass or Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions. That's correct. A lot of words. Fairly, a lot of words. <laughs> and in fairly wide use. Uh, since its inception, it has analyzed over a million defendants in the U.S. So it's, it's actually something that has been fairly broadly used in the courts. It is not the only software. There are many softwares like this. Mm -hmm. And I think what perhaps one of the most important things before we talk about efficacy and accuracy and fairness is that this is a commercial entity and the details of the algorithm are very tightly kept secret. So these decisions are being made uh, behind inside of a black box where we don't know what is actually happening. And I think that given what you said earlier, given the stakes here, I think that should be a little concerning to us. And, and so as a tool we use to determine bail and sentencing, as you say, it's, it's proprietary software as we might call it. Uh, you, exactly you try right. to get a look inside the algorithm by developing your own and testing it with randomly selected pool of people. What, what did you find? Right, we found a couple of interesting things. So one is, I mean, any time you're going to deploy algorithms like this to take decision making away from people, and, and let me say it, that's not a fundamentally bad thing. We don't object to using artificial intelligence and data to make more objective and data-driven decisions. That's a, that's, you know, it's a good thing. It's a, it's a worthy cause. But before you do that, you should ask the question, what is baseline? Where, where are the humans? And then where are the algorithms above that? And where do they fail and where do they succeed? And what we found, and I will say much to our surprise, and, and I should mention this is the, the, the undergraduate thesis work of Julia Dressel from here at Dartmouth, is that when we pulled 400 uh, workers online responding to a survey on Amazon's Mechanical Turk, it's an online workspace, they essentially have the indistinguishable accuracy from this commercial software that is being used in the courts. They were as accurate, as fair, and as inaccurate as the software. Huh. And, and right out of the gate, that was really interesting because you know these are people who are paying a dollar to respond to 50 questions, and, right. they're, and all they're seeing are just a very short paragraph about a defendant. They know nothing else. And they're basically as accurate as the software. Now, 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 when you say as accurate, from what I understand, they're accurate about 70% of the time. Is that right? 65 percent is about where they are. I would you know, expect so. if you know, I would expect that something with a computer involved in it would be accurate more than 65. You'd want it to be accurate. If I if I have a calculator and I had 150 and 350, I want it to come out to the same number all the time. Yeah. Well, I think that's the right question to ask, is if we're going to deploy this type of technology in the courts to make, let's be honest, life-altering decisions for defendants, whether that's bail, sentencing, or parole, I think it's reasonable to say 65 is a relatively low accuracy. Now, what is the right accuracy? I don't know, but I think it's reasonable to say that seems low because 35% of the time, you're getting it wrong, and the stakes are too high to make that many mistakes. Because the whole point of having something, you know, with a... It is to be more accurate than what the people <laughs> might be. That's exactly right. And so we were really surprised by this. But then it gets it gets even more interesting and more surprising after that. So we so Julie and I sat down. And we thought, well, first of all, how can this be? <laughs> how can random people online responding to a survey be as good as this commercial software being used in the courts to make life altering decisions? And we said, well, like, you know what? It, yeah. we, we understand it's a black box. We understand it's proprietary. Let's see if we can dig into that and really understand the algorithms. And, and here's what we did. 
we found um, that if you only give a very, very simple algorithm, it's the simplest possible machine learning classification algorithm, the kind of thing that we've known about for decades. If you give it just two pieces of data, how old somebody is and how many prior convictions they've had, you can get a 65% accuracy. The same as the commercial software and the same as uh, our users online. Now what's interesting is when you look at how it's making the decision, it turns out it's completely obvious. So here it is. If you are young and have committed a lot of prior um, crimes, you're high risk. And if you are old and you have very few priors, you're low risk. And the point here is that makes, by the way, perfect sense, but there's a couple of sort of issues here. So one is number of prior convictions is correlated to race. There are asymmetries in our society with the frequency of arrest prosecution and conviction based on race. So, so, so um, number of convictions is a proxy for race. So even though it looks like the algorithm should be race blind, mm. they are not necessarily race blind. And the other thing, and in some ways I think the, maybe the more important is the following. Imagine you're a judge and I tell you I have this proprietary software based on big data and big algorithms that can make a risk assessment. You could imagine that you would give a fair amount of weight to that. But if I now tell you that 12 people online said this person is high or low risk, but you would give that a different weight. And so our point is not so much use the software, don't use the software. It's there should be more transparency. There should be more understanding of what the algorithm does so that we can give a proportional weight to it so that we can say, you know what? This is a pretty simple thing. I've got two numbers. How old are they? Uh, how many prior convictions? I'm aware prior convictions have a racial asymmetry. I'm going to use those numbers in a way that is proportional to my confidence in its estimation. I understand. Now, I want to bring in another guest. Is that important, the transparency issue? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Dr. Fareed that, um, uh, and from a legal perspective, that really is the critical issue. And so um, these algorithms are being used not just in criminal justice, but also in human services to, to detect um, high-risk uh, uh, houses of, uh, ch for child abuse. Um, they're being used to assess teachers, and there have been a lot of uh, lawsuits where we're seeing increasing numbers of um, individuals whose fate is determined by these algorithms, and they can't challenge them because they are black boxes. So um, there are legal dimensions, and then they're also just, we expect our governments to be accountable, and mm -hmm. we can't know, um, we, we can't hold them accountable unless we understand how they're making decisions. You wrote in a Wired article that uh, governments have not made the shift to understanding this is policy making. What, what did you mean by that? What's your concern? Um, so if we just take this criminal justice um, decision, so we would like it to be perfectly accurate. No, none of these decisions, not human, not algorithmic, are perfectly accurate. Therefore, they are tuned one way or another to privilege certain policies. So in the criminal justice um, context, we may want more uh, false positives than false negatives, right? We may want more, we may want to be conservative about sentencing so that we make sure even people who pose a lower risk um, are, are locked up rather than let them go and have them uh, uh, commit a crime. So that's a policy choice, right? H exactly yeah. how you yeah. tune that. And the same thing in all these domains, um, those, those preferences are built into the algorithm, uh, but we don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. Speaking of we don't know what the algorithm are, uh, the algorithms are, I understand that you had a study where you filed 42 requests to get these algorithms. And what, what did you find out about how these contracts are handled and how much do the people using these tools actually know about right. what's going on? So our requests were um, to state and local jurisdictions about uh, across a, a range of domains um, uh, for the predictive algorithms they were using. And, and I should be clear, we were not, we, we didn't expect actually to get the software, because as Dr. Fareed said, they, this is proprietary and closely guarded. But we were looking even for things around, outside of the actual software, for example, what were your high-level objectives? What were some of the policies you, in, you incorporated? Um, and by and large, we got very little um, in response, mostly responses that they had no responsive documents. And um, sometimes we got the contracts, but sometimes not even. Um, and so we mm. think that the claims were essentially either that they had no information because cities are not um, bargaining for this information, um, or that they were protected by trade secret. Mm. Why not use, is there not any open source software? That could be used, and then and actually have a actually have a mandate by a, a city or a state that we're going to only buy and use open source software, so everybody can see what's inside. 
Yeah, so there's, um, I mean, New York City has just gone through this process, and I think their first, um, in the, they now have a new ordinance where they are going to und undertake a transparency um, initiative for their predictive algorithms. And I think their first thought was, we're going to mandate open source. Um, and I think they walked back from that um, just because there are so many commercial products that are not open source that they might want to use. Um, but that would be mm. that would be one way to handle it, although um, I don't think open source, even open source, gets you all the way there because, um, first of all, all this software has to be um, audited and adjusted and tuned and changed over time, and so that's it's a moving target. And then also there are implementation questions. A judge sees the predictions, sees the scores. Do they implement them or do they override them? So that's... Um, mm -hmm. the, the, we need to know more than just kind of what's in the black box, but how are they actually being right. implemented? Honey, any reaction? I, I agree with Dr. Goodman that um, uh, open source is sort of one extreme from where we are now. I think there's a middle ground. Um, so you can imagine, for example, uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, could say if you want to use these algorithms in these high stakes areas, uh, uh, criminal justice, then they need to be vetted by federal government agencies that have double blind assessment, uh, big data sets. Um, and very careful analysis. Uh, Dr. Goodman raises a good point too. This is a moving target. Um, so this is not something you do once and then stop. So I think there's a middle ground of protecting the commercial entities, but also protecting the, the public from these black box algorithms. Let's go to the phones. Let's head out to uh, Lexi in Boston. Hi, welcome to Science Friday. Hi, I'm calling um, to ask about how we, how we prevent human biases from, from creeping into these algorithms. So if you're training a machine learning algorithm with a data set that has inherent human biases, say from policing areas, how do we keep those biases from then informing the algorithms that we're using? Good question, honey. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, that's a that's the it's a great question. It's sort of the right question too. And 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 in some ways, this is really hard because we have this sense that since this is big data and AI, it doesn't reflect the biases. But the fact is, the data we shove into these algorithms reflect societal biases, as I mentioned, in terms of prior convictions. So in some ways, it's very hard to eliminate those biases from the data. Now, you can work hard at the algorithmic side and make sure you understand. What are the mistakes that you're making as a function of race, gender, age, ethnicity, whatever it is, and then try to balance the algorithms. But the data is the data, and so I think that the burden is going to be on the underlying algorithms to make sure they are making fair assessments. Right. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International, talking about uh, computer algorithms with Hani Farid and Ellen Goodman. Um, Ellen, uh, you know, I think about this as, well, you know, if I have a real person talking in court, I might have an opportunity to cross-examine that person about what their decisions are, but I have no opportunity to cross-examine the reasoning of an algorithm. Right. I mean, although that you can take that too far, right? So, so what, another thing you might say is, I never get to know what's inside a judge's head, right? A judge's head is a black box. Right. So is a superintendent's evaluation of my teaching. Um, so why should we get to know that now when we didn't get to know that before? And I think there are sort of two um, ways to think about that. One is that that's one of the virtues of algorithms is that we can know, um, and let's take advantage of that. But the second is that, you know, I think, um, as Dr. Freed said, that these, these algorithms, you know, are, you have a few competitors, but they're being rolled out, um, you know, across the country to hundreds of jurisdictions. And so if you do have an error or you have a bias, um, it, it, it scales and it gets repeated over and over in the way that a bias or a, a defect in the human mind doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you agree, honey? It's a great point. These algorithms can work on scale the way humans don't. And I, again, I want to be clear that we're, I don't think I'm saying, and I don't think Dr. Dr. Goodman is saying either, that we should not use big data and we should not use algorithms. I think we're saying more that there should be transparency, that we should understand them, and that you shouldn't be able to hide behind the, the, the black box. Because once we understand them, then we can deal with the limitations and the strengths. And, and look, in the end, 10, 20 years from now, they may do better than yeah. humans. They may eliminate some of the biases that we know exist, but I don't think we are there yet. And in the process, I think people are, are suffering because of failures of these algorithms. So, so what would make it better, make us get there? 
I am. Well, I, I mean, I, I can tell you at least on the technology side, I mean, there is hope that the machine learning algorithms will get better. We are seeing a real revolution in artificial intelligence and machine learning. We are seeing a revolution in the access to data. And I think that there is hope that you can build better algorithms that are more fair and more accurate. I will say, however, that we should keep in mind that predicting the future is really hard. Um, and we are asking these algorithms to look at a relatively small amount of information and make predictions about the next two years of a person's life. Life. And that, that is not an easy task. And so I think at some level we might want to ask ourselves, if this is not possible at a high level of accuracy, what else should we rely on in the criminal justice system? Mm -hmm. Ellen, any final comments about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a misconception um, right now. And if we think about these algorithms as sort of being the early days of, of the automobile industry, we didn't have seatbelts, we didn't have... We didn't have um, uh, safety protections, and so we need to put those um, in place. There's a misperception that this is all going to be cheap, that it's cheaper to use these algorithms um, than to use human beings. And I think the problem is that it sh it, to do it ethically, it shouldn't be that cheap because your city's uh, public, public jurisdictions are going to need um, to demand the right kinds of, um, uh, of data, information, records, checks, and then we're going to need auditing, and we're going to need a lot more transparency, and it's going to cost money. Okay. And we're going to be paying the people who make the algorithms. Yeah. But is that what you mean? It's, it's going to cost money? That, that we, I mean, they're paying the, the private vendors is, I think, built in. We know that. Mm -hmm. But it's these other things, these public expenditures that are going to have to be made in order to do it ethically. And if it's done on the cheap, um, you know, I think ultimately it's not going to be cheap because we're going to have a lot of litigation around it um, mm -hmm. because these due process concerns are not going to be handled. Well, that's uh, something that we'll continue to follow.